think we can put the presentation up. Uh, it's always very intimidating to go after great speakers, and I can't say that there's 1% of what uh, Harry said that I disagree with. Um, so I, in the next 10 minutes or so, or eight minutes or so, I'll take, try to take some of what he said and apply it to the shape and the structure of the digital universe in, in China. Because it is a parallel universe to the United States digital universe. It's not the same, although certain things look the same. You know, in advertising, well actually I'm not allowed to say advertising anymore. That's an outmoded word in today's era of digital empowerment. I will say instead that I am an engineer of media neutral, idea centric participation platforms. <laughs> but in any case, in advertising, uh, we have something called uh, insight. Insight. Shao Pei Dong Cha. Dong Cha. And I'm going to build on the Confucian conflict that Harry mentioned to say that I believe in China there is a unifying insight for Chinese people overall. There are two fundamentally different impulses that coexist at the same time and actually affect the digital universe in China. The first is projection of status. Woman There is a dragon in every heart of Chinese people. Chinese people are meritocratic, they are strivers, they want to climb the hierarchy, they want to get to the top of Mount Glory and project their status. That's why there are flying horses that are selling so well. But of course, also, as Harry mentioned, it's a profoundly hierarchical society. We've all heard of the Bagua and the Wulun, but China, the China is a hierarchical society in which the individual does not exist independent of his responsibilities and obligations to other people. So the way of moving forward is to master the hierarchy, become an expert at the rules. And this is the same today as it was 2,000 years ago throughout the, uh, the dynastic China. And brands that are able, companies that are able to resolve this tension between projection of status and protection of economic interests and your status on the hierarchy are brands that touch the heart of Chinese people. And I say one more time that the internet in China reflects this Chinese Confucian conflict, a unifying conflict. <laughs> So what is the internet to Chinese people in their hearts? It is a blank canvas of self-expression. The Economist recently memorably called it a giant cage. It is a, an area where you can express what you want to do, who you are, what you think, but in a way that is safe and largely protected due to the distance of avatars and digital uh, dimension. So, what you see in, on the internet is, is very often emotional. It is <laughs> extremely social. If you take a look at uh, that, that uh, well, I shouldn't say this, but the CNN reference that took place after the Tibetan protests back in 2008 before the Olympics. But with, over there on the right, you have you know protests against the Malaysian government for MH370, again causing a cyclone in the Twitterverse or the Weiboverse. But the, the thing that's interesting right there is the middle uh, photograph. That's a celebrity called Wang Zhang. Long story short, it achieved the largest Weibo tweeting in history. This is a Chinese celebrity that had the audacity to cheat on his lovely wife, and then he got exposed in the, in the, in the, uh, in the digital universe, and this caused the largest number of retweets in human history, two million. That's emotional, that's psychological, that's letting it out in a deep, deep way. So there's a lot of self-expression, and the way that Chinese people engage in the, in, the, in the digital universe is in fact quite emotional. You take a look at the five largest activities there. One is, in, the first is instant messaging. It's a way to communicate with people. Mobile is social, so it's a way for people to feel not isolated and to reinforce their bond with society. And blogging, every Chinese person is a blogger. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Everybody has to say what they have to say, but again, they're doing it safely. They're doing it from a distance. It's not just raising your hand and speaking in a public square. And if you take a look at the role of social networks in China and in branding, it's much larger than it is in the United States. 
If you go by this study that was done in 2012, social networks are a good source of information on brand experience. Look at the difference between China, 23% in America, 8%, which is just to say that people clinging to the internet for reliable views for, of their peers and online opinion leaders, KOLs. And even if you take a look at the next uh, statistic, I post product ratings and reviews at least once a month. 75% say yes in China versus only 20% in the United States. This points to a different relationship with all things digital. It is a site of safe self-expression. This is why Taobao, which is the world's largest e-commerce site, and by the way, China is the largest e-commerce market now in the world, having just surpassed the United States last year, is such a phenomenon. But what I'd like to say that's a little bit less known is that e-commerce in China did not take off until fundamental self-protection imperatives were in fact realized. eBay, about 10 years ago, crashed and burned in China because it was fundamentally a Western business model. They didn't offer the security that was required to reassure people that their digital transactions were safe, number one. And number two, they didn't, uh, they were talking about bargaining auctioning the thrill of victory, when in fact we all know that Chinese are they're pragmatic, right? So what Chinese want from the internet is transparency, and they want, as Harry said, a bargain. In China, intelligence is the sexiest attribute. The smartest boy in the class is the uh, sexiest boy in the class. So Taobao, right, took off when these fundamental imperatives that are cultural were reinforced in terms of Alipay, which is reassuring that you don't have to pay anything until you kick the merchandise and make sure that everything is okay. So digital transactions first had to be safe. And then we've all heard about Singles Day, 1111. Now this is massive retail therapy. This is shopping to help this lonely generation that Harry talked about sell their, their, their hearts with digital transactionalism. So in China, transactionalism is hot, not cool. Take a look at WeChat, which is owned by Tencent. WeChat, within 24 months, had 300 million people using it. It's different from Weibo, which is now on the decline. Weibo is broadcast, Twitter-like. WeChat is actually much more intimate. It's self-selecting. It's safer. Not everybody can see what you say. 300 million people. Again, reinforcing this imperative of safe self-protection on the internet, which is, uh, you can say anything you want to say, but you're careful about who is going to see it. That's why WeChat is so popular. And how does WeChat make its money? WeChat makes its money through, of course, gaming, through, in addition, uh, this, selling of emoticons and pictures. These are fun little things that we Americans would say, it's a little bit off point in terms of making our lives better, but it's ultimately about lubricating social interaction. It helps online dialogue and exchange. And I'd like to raise a hat to Harry. He didn't know that I was gonna present this chart, uh, but this is one of the most successful online activities in internet history not just in China, but in the entire world. It was conducted in 2007 or 8, I believe. It's called Get on the Can. Long story short, Pepsi shook the internet universe by offering people the chance to have their faces emblazoned on special edition cans of Pepsi Cola. 750 million participated in this. There were 150 million people who voted, and 30 million people actually went through the trouble of uploading their photographs to try and get on the can. This shows that this is, in fact, an emotional uh, universe. And another one that I'd like to say is Fang Ke. Fang Ke is one of the largest uh, youth retailers, they had another very successful promotion that killing two birds with one stone. Long story short, what they were able to do is uh, you know, put a online ad of themselves displaying proudly projecting themselves in Funko clothing, but also if you sold anything based on your online ad, you got a cut of the commission. So it's both about ego gratification on one hand, and on the other hand, very pragmatically <coughs> earning a little bit of hard cash. This is what causes happiness in China. The resolution of projection of status on one hand and protection of uh, identity. And so if 
people in China, if internet providers can abide by this fundamental confusion conflict between regimentation and ambition, we are able to put money and at the same time touch the heart of 600 million netizens, 600 million and growing. Thank you very much. online behavior. And so Tom pointed out, really is a cultural difference. China's have, is more emotional connection to the internet, and Western are a much more functional uh, connection to the internet. So Harry highlighted generational differences, particularly the millennial, as key players. So on a macro level, other trends manifest across Asia and, glo and globally, perhaps in Latin America, Africa, Middle East, in other words, is this global phenomenon is, or more, is only China specific? So I'd love to hear what you think of that. You oh. huh? Well, uh, I'm not a global expert. Um, however, I would say that uh, when you take a look at, it is true that we often co-mingle emerging market insights, what happens when the middle class rises, versus uh, cultural insights. And I would say that in non-Western societies across the world, the key unifying factor is a hierarchical worldview. It is not individualistic. When I say individualistic, I mean, again, society encouraging the individual to define himself independent of society's expectations. So this is true in UAE, the United Arab Emirates, it's true in South Africa, it's true in India, and it's also true in China. But what's different about the Confucian cluster is that ambition part that Barry talked about. Ambition goes down very deep into Chinese society. Everybody wants to be the emperor of his own corner. So ambition goes into the, the, the rural fringe in China as soon as people start getting hopes of being able to move forward and advance in life. So I think that this incredible urge to surge that is evident in e uh, Singles Day 1111 and the explosive growth in internet and social networking is not just about uh, hierarchy, it's also about ambition and self-expression. So I'd say it's distinct in China. If, um, if there are a lot of similarities between what's happening in China and the rest of the world, maybe I can highlight a little bit about where we see some of the differences are. E-commerce in China is very much lifestyle. E-commerce is not something that you do in addition to shopping. E-commerce is very often how you would shop and the way you would shop in China. So, uh, so that, I think that's one big difference. Uh, the second big difference is that the categories that are now the highest penetrated in China are apparel, shoes, uh, and then uh, consumer electronics. Travel is relatively low. Whereas in the US, travel is still one of the biggest e-commerce categories of consumption. So that's somewhat different. And I suppose when the Chinese have enough of all of their shoes and the closets and stuff, they're gonna to wanna to wear it and go somewhere. And then travel will, become, will come up. And that's why stocks like China has done very, very well because of all of this uh, domestic and inbound consumption of travel. And I think the, the point that Harry just made on social uh, shopping is fundamental. It's not an alternative to offline shopping, it is shopping. And in, in lower tier cities, you know, another statistic is 57% of all online shopping is new shopping. It's not replacing offline shopping, partially because it's facilitated through mobile technology, which is distinct in China, but partially because the shopping is so fundamental to people's identity. And apparel is, yes, relatively cheap, unlike travel, but it is about identity badge and getting a good value to look good in public. So it sounds like these trends are really absolutely transforming Chinese society, um, which I think is really, really interesting compared to the US. Um, online shopping is a channel of shopping, it's not the lifestyle of shopping. So Tom has suggested that the protection versus projection status dynamic is inherent in confusion uh, society. So Harry, what do you think of that? Well, up until Xi Jinping took office, I think uh, there was a very, very relevant study that talked about how um, only one other country in the world that would deem um, having a body full of luxury brand logos on your body 
to be a definition of success rather than superficiality. And that was Russia. Um, so, but uh, that was prior to the recent crackdown uh, that we've had in, uh, in consumption in the luxury sector. And so, but um, nowadays, I believe that um, uh, I believe that the Chinese still believe in more self-consumption, experimental luxury consumption, rather than consumption of luxury goods for the sake of gifting. Gifting, by any estimates, whether it's uh, J.P. Morgan or other Kinsey reports that you would um, refer to, can be accounted for anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of consumption. I mean, the Chinese society is very much based on guanxi, anyway, and guanxi is very much about how much deposit do I make into that relationship, and over time, hopefully, I would withdraw. And some people believe that over my life, my guanxi would have a set of net positive accounts. Some people would believe that I want to leave this world with a set of negative accounts, right? So, but the guanxi and the notion of guanxi building is very much what's driven the gifting market. And the gifting occasion has driven approximately one third of consumption in China. And so since the recent policy crackdown, we've seen significant drops uh, in luxury goods in the categories of liquor, watches, and other small luxury items of gifting. So uh, I think um, for some consumption, that category remains very, very robust and it's growing. But for gifting, that seems to have been hard hit. Now, a year ago, people were saying, well, this is going to be short-lived. A year later, it's still going on. So we actually don't know how, long, how much longer that's going to go on for. Thank you. So let's talk about the difference in East and West brand perception, such as PepsiCo, Nike, etc. What examples highlight the contrast between how consumers in China and the West perceive and identify with these certain brands? Well, this, is, this transcends the questions of uh, digital China. But um, in terms of, there are two golden rules of marketing in China that don't apply in the rest of the world. The first golden rule, and they're related, the first golden rule is to justify a price premium. You have to maximize public consumption. Chinese people will pay a price premium for things that help them project identity into broader society. Starbucks, for example. Starbucks has performed the Houdini Act of Marketing. Right now, there are 1,500 Starbucks stores in China. And a little secret is, the Chinese don't like coffee. How is this possible? This is possible because the business model of China has changed fundamentally for Starbucks. Uh, Howard Schultz doesn't talk about a third space, a site of relaxation and intimate self-fulfillment between home and office. The Starbucks stores in China are bigger, they have post a larger menu. There aren't individual stuffed chairs. There are tables, there are, but there are more tables that are long that can accommodate more people. Starbucks is a site of gangs going in there to collectively proclaim affiliation with the new generation elite. And that Starbucks badge that comes out of every cup of coffee is projected into society. Haggadahs is another example of public consumption. No Chinese young person is going to pay 60 renminbi for two scopes of ice cream and bring it home to enjoy, indulge oneself in front of an illegal DVD with a girlfriend. It's not going to happen. So public consumption justifies price premium. The second golden rule is related is that benefits are internalized in the West oftentimes. They are externalized in China. What I mean to that is all products in China are a means to an end even cheap ones. In the West, when you sell a shower gel, you sell it based on sensuous indulgence in the shower. Ah, that's nice. In China, it's an energizing start to your day. You start the day with a kick. So benefits need to be so-called externalized. And this is true only in China. Only in Asia. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what Thomas just said. Um, I may only add that um, that uh, there have been a lot of case studies about successful foreign brands that entered the market and failed, and a lot of companies that have localized and have succeeded. So I, I don't think we need to go into that world with one thesis. What I think is very, very exciting that we're seeing in China is that um, there are categories, take fashion for example. We think that there are a lot of very, very exciting fashion brands in China that have been for years been OEM manufacturers for foreign luxury brands. Well, they have gotten the know-how, they've met the specifications, and they've been exporting for years. They haven't gotten quite the branding and the marketing down yet. I venture to guess that some of these companies 
are probably a few seasons away from becoming globally competitive. Now, at the moment, their spelling might be off, the brand name is kind of awkward, you know, no vowels, and it's hard to pronounce. The packaging is quite wrong, the soap bar tanks are not going in the right places. But I think it's only a matter of time when consultants and agencies such as Tom would come in, bring their world-class practices, and layer on to the manufacturing capabilities that they've been doing, and compete globally. Now, that's the big question. How come there are no domestic Chinese luxury brands to speak of? Many are trying, but none have succeeded yet. And so as a venture capitalist, this is what we get excited about. As we look around the corner, we're seeing some very, very capable, <coughs> smart young brands that may have a chance. May I build on what Gary is saying? The, the uh, rise of the Chinese brand, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Chinese have another expression, liar of Hong Kong. It's a long road to Rome. I will say that I'm both optimistic and also a little bit realistic. Optimistic because JWT, um, the, a leading uh, engineer of, of media neutral and data center participation platforms. <laughs> Just kidding. 45% uh, of our revenue in China comes from local companies. But none of them, to Harry's point, has passed through what I call the inflection point of strong brands. And what I mean by strong brands is the ability to charge a price premium in markets that are abroad. Not one brand, none of them. And I think that the reason for this is profoundly cultural. I think it goes back again to you know, cultural imperatives in terms of focus on concrete as opposed to celebration of abstract ideas. So long story short, Chinese companies are very sales driven. They tend to be relatively uh, siloed and it makes it very hierarchical, uh, old style traditionalists in terms of authority. And it makes it very difficult for brand equity to take root. That is long-term consistency in messaging, which again is very abstract. So I would like to also celebrate the day where the local Chinese brand is a global player, or even more modestly, the local Chinese brand can command a premium in its own market, but that day has not yet come. Yeah, I want to talk more about single state because as a retailer, we have a lot to learn. So just to give you some um, idea, so our, in the U.S., the single biggest day online is called Cyber Monday. It's the Monday after Black Friday. So that day, we did, what, a little over $1.7 billion. We were thrilled with it. It's about 18% increase. But in Singles Day, Harry said, both of you said, it's over $5 billion in China. So what can we learn from it? Is there anything that we could take away that would work in the West? I don't think so. I mean, uh, <laughs> of course, I don't, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, of course, uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, offer construction that's very relevant. There's, it's, it's mostly buy one, get one free. But I think the fact that single state is so huge is distinctly Chinese. Again, it's done by Tencent, and, uh, and, which is a leading um, internet provider, which is, by the way, sanctioned by the government. Let's always remember that all large internet companies exist with the complicit <coughs> and tacit uh, agreement of the government. So this is something that is sanctioned to do. Right? It is an activity that de facto has been endorsed and mandated by a top-down, patriarchically benevolent government structure. So it's not just bottom-up fun time, all right? It's a way of stimulating the economy. So that's point one, it's endorsed. Secondly, it's deeply emotional. And it gets back to what Harry's point is, is that this is a generation of singletons, of people that feel more and more isolated from, uh, from society and a little bit more anxious about the future than previous generations. So it's massive retail therapy that I think puts uh, a day at the spa in Los Angeles to shame. <laughs> um, having worked in the US and uh, been involved with uh, department stores and, uh, when I was a, a, a buyer at Macy's in New York, I think the Chinese actually have a lot to learn from uh, the U.S. as far as um, special event, um, uh, one-day sales, uh, uh, blue oil light, and so on and so forth. But let me just share some statistics with you about the one-day sale with Alibaba. In 2009, there were only 27 brands that participated on the November 11th um, uh, Commerce Day. And there was approximately 50 million of transactions that was done that day. 
Last year, there was 10,000 merchants that participated. So the number of SKUs that became available online from November 11th went up significantly, and that's why we did about $19 billion. The second fact that's important to note is that they were done at very, very steep discounts. Chinese brands in China do not have the same outlet programs that some of the more established fashion brands have around the world. Ralph Lauren, for example, has a very, very dedicated outlet line that's made with lower cost, lower specifications. That's not the case in China. Today, if you were to go online and buy a pair of Adidas Crazy Night Shoes, for example, it would cost you online 530 quiet. Whereas if you went to a store, it would be 820 quiet. That same 820 quiet was discounted 50% on singles day. I'm actually very, very concerned. I actually think that that may not be sustainable uh, because there may not be enough inventory every year to liquidate at that cost of <coughs> liquidation. Um, in fact, many of my friends have run successful brands in China that sold a ton of stuff would argue that um, it's a very, very good way of liquidating goods, but it may not be a sophisticated approach as we know it today. I'll give you another example. Uh, Lancome, you've activated concentrates online. It sells for 628 kwai. The same item in the department store would sell for 1,080 kwai. So it is well known and understood that if you were to buy online, it is just a lot cheaper. something that everybody is talking about in China. Right? The, uh, the old, old model is, uh, for those of you who do not know China, and I, uh, I'm sorry if I'm repeating something you already know, we're about five companies that accounts for about 50 to 60 percent of all logistics that's shipped and sold in China. The rest of it are usually pretty fragmented. Uh, and so the big conversation is what money is going into two things in China. It's going into mobile internet consumption, and it's also going into uh, um, uh, logistics. Oh, sorry, and big data, if you were to really go into it, because we're relatively unsophisticated in terms of big data analysis. So, um, the, 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 the biggest concern uh, about the 11, 11 phenomenon is that the consumers are benefiting. However, it's coming at the cost of viable business models. Because when you reduce the price that low, it's really all about driving customer acquisition. So the belief is that if I lower it enough, I will get enough users, I will scale, and eventually the business model will creep up. So a lot of companies in China are not really uh, successful or viable e-commerce companies, but they're mainly private equity backed or financed in other ways. So there are signs now that there are pressures on companies to make sure that they have healthy margins, cost of logistics are within reason, and that the acquisition costs is uh, reasonable. I'll give you an example. If you were to list on page one of Taobao for one day, one banner ad, that would cost you about 60,000 kwai. You can buy a two-page spread on GQ magazine for a month for a third of that. Very, very different model. So the cost of acquiring customers online is no longer as as at the, the cheap route to market that once everybody thought. Because the rental costs and your acquisition costs, in fact, are quite uh, similar to what your fixed rental costs were if you were operating a retail store. And, and taking those comments and backing up a little bit, of a, I think it's important to understand that in China, there's no way to overcome scale as an important competitive imperative. Right now, the cost of media is prohibitively expensive for brands who are not yet in China and have not yet built broad awareness. Uh, and this is something that I think most medium-sized Western or foreign players haven't quite grasped. There's no shortcut into China. And just as Harry was talking about uh, Singles Day and the fact that ultimately it's not a profitable proposition for the vast majority of online retailers, the internet and digital marketing, there's no shortcut there either. 
You need to come in with scale, you need to come in big, you need to build broad awareness, and then you also need to invest in a value proposition. The internet is not the way that you can somehow escape these fundamental or timeless marketing truths. Okay, of course we're running out of time, but I have to ask this closing question. Um, if we look five to 10 years out over the horizon, how do you both describe China's e-commerce business? Well, I'm not an expert, as again, I'm in advertising and I exist beyond the fringes of legitimacy. Harry's a, <laughs> Harry is a real businessman. Uh, but, um, let, let me say that I, I think that I think certain things are going to stay more or less the same because we have to take a look at China's growth model. It's all about urbanization. And what that means is there are constantly new waves of new consumers coming onto the Chinese landscape. So, and then ultimately coming into the uh, middle class and the upper middle class. So there are different segments in China, and those same segments will exist until the urbanization growth paradigm really runs out of steam. But a little bit more broadly, I'd say that I don't have any proof for this hypothesis, but I think that getting back to the fact that the internet giants exist in partnership or with the complicity of the Chinese government, I think if you take a look at what's happening right now with Alibaba and its uh, uh, microfinancing and its loans and its interest that's being paid now uh, and offering more than state-owned banks, I think that the services is a huge area of interest that the government cannot do with its bricks and mortar offline alternatives. Services is a big gap in the Chinese consumer landscape. And I suspect that the business models of Baidu and other large companies are really gonna be uh, focused on providing only services that are sanctioned by the government. So uh, something that can be controlled, but also experimented with. Chinese love to experiment with small micro Singaporean models. And I do think that, that, that there's a ample room for services to be provided on the internet in a way that doesn't exist in the West. Um, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> right? No, no, um, it's such a big topic. Um, it's a great question. Um, just top line, I think that um, what we've seen today in e-commerce in China is just simply the beginning. I think 10 years from now, we're not gonna talk about e-commerce as if it did something different. We're just gonna talk about it in the students of e-commerce. Um, so the 10% of retail sales today will likely be 20, 30, 40%. It's anyone's guess. It will be enabled by some of the biggest players in their investments in logistics and mobile. The second thing I would venture to guess is that um, there are a lot of new categories that are going to become very, very important in China. Pharmaceutical, for example, today is less than 2% distributed and sold online. Fresh groceries, meats, seafoods, vegetables are only 6 to 7% sold online today. I think many of these categories will become part of the basic staple of uh, shopping online. Um, I think that the retailers, the traditional retailers, are going to be under significant pressure. I was talking to my good buddy who runs Nike in China. He was saying to me that they're closing hundreds and hundreds of their wholesale retail stores. But the number of their flagship stores are doubling. So I think the Chinese, as they shop more online, they will look a little bit more like the U.S. retail model would look like. Looking at is go after retail theater, retail experiences, specialty, big shop where you go in, get the experience of the brand, and then go home and possibly buy online. That would be another one of my predictions. Um, I think that, um, uh, finally, last but not least, I think uh, if many of you have visited e-commerce companies in China, there's not a lot of E behind the, uh, the companies, right? <laughs> there's a web page, but there's a, hundreds of staff on a live chat room. Everything is done one-to-one. -one. You call, you know, the big joke is Home Depot came and was selling do it yourself. Well, the joke is you were merely paying somebody else to do it for you. You weren't really quite doing it yourself. And so the E behind companies in today, in Chinese companies today, is very, very low. Not a lot of it is bought on buy now, click here, ship there tomorrow. So I would hope that in 10 years time, these companies will become more sophisticated and that we would have um, uh, a better CRM system. Because many of those customers today, 
uh, companies today do not have a very, very good profile of how you shop, what you buy, and how to reference sell and upsell. So these would be some of my predictions of areas of opportunity. And then last but not least, consolidation. Absolutely will happen is that a lot of these companies simply won't survive because they don't have a legitimate business to, to be in the market in the first place. No, I just want to add an exclamation point to uh, Harry's point. No matter what happens in the future, the Chinese are not going to fundamentally engage in the internet in a new way unless their entire social structure changes, which is not going to happen. Reassurance of any transaction is going to be fundamental now, 2030 and 2050. So we have to make sure that as China evolves, as China becomes bigger, as China becomes more modern, more internationalized, China is not becoming Western, and the universe of the digital uh, consumer will not become Western either. It will assume its own form that is modern and international, and to a certain extent, parallel. Thank you so much. And I have to say, you know, we could probably talk for days about this topic. And our time has run out, and I want to thank both of our guests, Tom and Harry, for sharing such insightful information with us. Thank you. Thank you.